Welcome to the Thyroid Fixer Podcast, where I'm all about helping you lose that stubborn weight that won't come off no matter what you do. Get off your couch at 2 p.m. and get through your day with energy and stop counting the hairs that come out of your head. I'm your host, Dr. Amy, and I'm here to help you get optimized with your thyroid and your hormones. It's all part of living our mantra, better thyroid, better hormones equals a better life. So let's get you back to being the badass human that you're meant to be. Let's approach it from a thyroid and hormone optimization standpoint. Between myself and my guests, you will be loaded down with information to take control of your health and get back to being you. So let's get started. You know, I am so passionate about giving you information that you can implement to actually change your life, change your body, fix your thyroid, fix your hormones. So that is why I am doing for the first time ever a fix your thyroid masterclass. Time to break free from the fatigue and the fat that we're dealing with and that we're so frustrated with. So I want you to attend live. I want you to be there live. We are going to go over so many things. The TSH trap, what doctors should test and they don't test, even integrative and functional practitioners, how they're treating or how they're scamming you, these thyroid detoxes out there, what supplements you really should be using. We're going to give you real answers and we're going to end with a live Q&A with me. So that's why you have to be there live. We are doing this in September. So click the link below. It'll have all of the information, the dates, the times, the sign up info. Go to fixyourthyroid.com and you'll find it there. You'll find the details. I want you there. I want you signed up. I want to see you in the meeting and I want you asking your questions and taking notes. Let's do this together to get you to the next level. Fixyourthyroid.com. Are you trying to lose weight? I mean, most of us are, but when you cut calories or you use those new Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss injectables, you're not going to get in enough protein. And that's the problem. That's where you start losing muscle and fat at the same time. You don't want to lose your sexy lean muscle. So key on aminos helps prevent muscle loss. Key on aminos can help you feel full when you're cutting calories, which uh, that's a bonus. And it's going to help you build that lean muscle for a faster metabolism, a lean tone, sexy body. So add in Keon Aminos. I do it every single day. I drink them during my workout. And then I'll also drink them throughout the day because that's supporting my muscles, keeping my muscles as I'm just sitting at my desk working. Add in Keon Aminos. Try them out. I love the berry. I love the mango. But you're going to love all the flavors. Toss it in your water. Shake it up. Drink it throughout the day. And then, like I said, definitely during a workout. So you are going to use my link to save 20% off. So that's a no-brainer for you to try these out. You're going to go to getkion.com. That's G-E-T-K-I-O-N.com backslash thyroid. And that is going to give you 20% off your first order. Let me know what you think. Dr. Fiona Lovely, I mean, you know that I love you. We have such great chemistry, but... One of the main reasons I'm excited to have you on the show outside of your personality and our great conversations is that we have not yet discussed what happens in the brain as we as women go through perimenopause and menopause. And this is a topic that I really believe needs to be discussed more because like anything in women's health, when we bring it to the surface and we bring it to the table and women become aware of it and it almost like lights them up and makes, it helps them to make sense of their world and what's going on with their body. And the brain in menopause is not something that has been discussed enough. You know, we're just hearing like little trickles of it here and there, but we really need to help women understand not only what's going on with their body and hormones during menopause, but what's going on with their brain. So Mm -hmm. your expertise on this subject is just, I'm so excited. It's so needed. Thank you. Thank you. It is. It is very much needed. And what's neat about this subject is that it's, uh, it's emerging. We haven't until very recently understood just how critical the brain is in a woman's experience at perimenopause and menopause. 
No, it really is. And, and I mean, you've done the research on it. You're a clinical neuroscientist, but what actually got you interested in with your podcast? It's not your mother's menopause. I mean, what got you interested in this whole perimenopause menopause time in a woman's life? And then specifically the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So when I was a brand new baby practitioner, I'm a chiropractor. That's my professional designation. I had a patient come in and it had to be my first month or two of practice. And she was somewhere in her forties and she had a toddler and she was there for me to treat neck pain and, and headaches, as I recall it. And at some point she started asking me questions about menopause what I understood to be menopause, but her as a 40 something woman didn't understand that that was related to menopause. She figured it was because she'd had a child as she was older and et cetera. And so I just, you know, I had lots of time and not many patients at that point in my career. So I just chatted her ear off. And many times she said to me, why doesn't my doctor know this? And where can I get more information? Can you tell me more? And then she started sending her girlfriends that were in the same situation in to see me. And so even though I was just barely in my 30s at that point, I knew enough about it because I'd done the functional medicine training while I was studying to be a chiropractor. And I just shared what I knew. I just shared what was in my heart and in my brain, I guess, for her. And she was grateful. And she was the reason why I leaned into being a menopause expert. And that evolved over time because what I realized was that there were so many women that were older than me at that point that wanted help that had no idea how to even ask for the help, whether it was thyroid or sleep or, you know, heavy bleeds or, or, now, you know, anxiety and depression are part of the perimenopause uh, spectrum. Yep. Anyways, so fast forward to quite a few years later, about 13 years ago, I took some training in functional neurology, thinking it would be kind of a cool weekend seminar. 13 years later, I'm still doing it. I took my clinical neuroscience degree in functional neurology. And so I started at some point in my career fixing broken brains. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, those things were always separate. They were like, okay, you come see Dr. Lovely because you have a brain that needs help, or you come see Dr. Lovely because you're somewhere in need of the, the functional medicine cascade for women's health. And typically that's around perimenopause. And, and then one day it kind of dawned on me, I thought, oh shit, I've got all of the information in my head to start talking about a woman's brain and how a brain changes because of the egress of the hormones at midlife. Midlife meaning somewhere in our 30s, the hormones start to change. And when the hormones change, the neurotransmitters change. And when the neurotransmitters change, we have a different experience in life, both physically and psychologically. And I think that's something that is, okay, whatever I just said, I just gave me goosebumps. So there <laughs> Somebody's reinforcing that yeah. from somewhere. I don't Absolutely. know. Maybe it's Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pearl. <laughs> it's Pearl for sure. That's essentially how I ended up doing this. And I, what's really been fascinating the last few years as Lisa Moscone's research is really taking a forefront for us, is she, as a PhD researcher, is showing us how estrogen, et cetera, changes the brain chemistry and the brain structure, specifically at menopause. And she started that work because she had a grandmother with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And she recognized the and there are other family members for her that have Alzheimer's. And she recognized as a younger woman, that those changes for those family members started in the menopause transition. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, what her research did for me and Roberta Brinton's research as well. I'm also a huge fan of Luann Brizendine and her work as well. And those, those ladies and their work really allowed me to put these pieces together in my own brain. And then I realized that there's just not very many of us talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk about it from a clinical research point of view, but who are the clinicians on the ground that have the toolkit to show a woman how to have a different experience at midlife? Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that. And I'm so, so grateful that you are 
one of those women out there talking about it amongst the maybe five or six that are. And you're right, it's a topic that, oh my gosh, we just we just need to, to speak more on. I'm not sure which direction I want to go first. I think let's start with just for the ladies out there that might be in that perimenopause state. I mean, like you said, really, even in their 30s, hormones are starting to shift and change. What are they noticing or what should they be paying attention to that is not, I don't want to call say it normal, but that is that could be related to hormonal decline as it relates to their brain or their mood? Yeah, sure. First, I want to say, I'll come back to that. Yeah, I want to set the stage a little bit. Okay. Out of the top 10 symptoms that are most commonly reported for women in menopause, and this is done by our friend Andrea Donsky and wearemorphous.com. Mm-hmm. She's done surveys, which are, are show, showing us a whole other picture of menopause. It's not just hot flashes. So Andrea's research of the top 10 symptoms nine out of 10 of them are brain-based. Wow. Okay. I know. Again, goosebumps. What just happened? Yeah, I did. I just, I I seriously have goosebumps. Okay. Me too. Me too. So nine out of 10. So what does that mean? It means a woman is absolutely, we are, we are not understood at this point in our lives. And there are so many of us that have been misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, around brain-based symptoms. What do I mean by that? I mean depression. I mean anxiety. I mean paranoia. I mean pervasive thoughts. One of my favorites to talk about that is called anhedonia in the uh, medical research is the lack of joy and the lack of happiness. I know. And I've experienced that myself in my menopause transition in the last 18 months. And it's been breathtakingly bad, meaning uh, this is what happens to me, by the way, I understand something because I've read the research, but then I experience and I go, oh my God, so many people need to know this. Whether it's low back pain or it's insomnia or it's the anhedonia, right? So as someone who's had a very, how would I say it? Very rich emotional life. It's been tough being flat, right? Now, if I was to go to my GP and say to her, I just don't feel the same. I love her, by the way. I'm grateful for her. So let me not diss her. But I'm going to use her as an example. So if I was to go to her and say, I just, like, everything's just kind of meh. Thankfully, I have a great life. So I have all these habits I can continue to do with muscle memory because through things I've done and I know they make me happy. Do I feel the same way now about them that I did before? I don't. But that's one of the things that happens with the egress of estrogen in particular, although progesterone and testosterone are involved. If I went to see her, she'd say, it sounds to me like you're depressed. Here's an antidepressant. And then if I said to her, well, you know, I don't sleep through the night all that well. Now, the truth is, I have great help now. So I do. I've got hormones that I take that keep me asleep at night. But there was a lot of years that I didn't. And I didn't know to ask. This is me as the menopause expert. I didn't know to ask. It started when I was about 37. Mm -hmm. So and I was hustling. I just finished professional school a few years. I was building a practice. I had, you know, I had other professionals in the office. I had HR I had to manage. I had to do the, you know, all of the things, right? which we talk about uh, autoimmunity. I mean, I think about my girlfriends that are in the same position as me that have done the same kind of work. So many of us have autoimmune disease. Yes. That's a bigger conversation. We'll put yeah, that to the side. Stress <laughs> and, and running yourself. Oh, ragged. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Basically turning away from the feminine spirit is what that is. Hyper-masculinizing ourselves to not rest and keep moving and all of those things. Which can um, but serve to go back. us well at times, but Absolutely. we need to still pull in that feminine energy and remind ourselves like we still have different needs than men. Yes, very much so. Very much so. So I could have been easily misunderstood by my medical doctor who knows me really well, but she only has certain tools, right? 
So here's what we know. We know that when a woman's ovaries start to signal the decline of the hormones. Now, this is what happens in our 30s and early 40s. Estrogen goes up and down, up and down and up and down. So we can be up one day and down the next. Meanwhile, progesterone and testosterone do a slow de decline. Progesterone first, testosterone a little, low, a little later. Yep. And over time, to come back to your question, mm -hmm. we start to lose the quality of our sleep. So either we wake in the night, can't get back to sleep, or we don't sleep long enough, or we're awake at night because we're busy looking at a phone thinking that it's going to allow us to go to sleep, which we mm -hmm. know that's not possible. Right. The quality of our moods change. We don't have the same ability to raise our moods if we're not feeling great. Anxiety can be crushing during this time. It absolutely was for me. Again, if I'd gone to my GP, I knew enough not to go to my GP because I knew enough to know that it wasn't, well, let's be honest, I'm in Canada. And so cannabis helped a great deal. Mm -hmm. Right. It was yeah. during a time for me where both my parents were sick. My dad was passing away. I'm trying to run a business. It was right before COVID, blah, blah. Oh, right. Thank God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank and, God and, for cannabis. <laughs> right. Know, but, right. But you were not Prozac deficient and you knew exactly. that. Exactly. I knew it wasn't that. I knew there were just some times that I was just spinning and I couldn't stop spinning. So again, if I'd gone to my GP, I would have likely been given medication for that. And at this point in my life, at 51, I could have had up to six or so medications if I had gone down that route. And listen, if it's warranted, I have no issue with it. Right. But so often the misunderstanding of what a woman is actually going through with her body and her brain between 35 and 55, mm -hmm. there's a whole cluster of things that can show up in that time. And it turns out most of them are brain-based. Isn't that fascinating? Crazy, crazy. I know that's a lot of information I just threw at you, isn't it? I know. Well, that's a lot of information. That's all right. I'm, we're going to unpack this. So when you okay. say brain-based. Yes. Okay. So we know the sleep, the mood is, are there any symptoms and maybe they're not but i'm just spitballing this question are there any symptoms that we get that really start in the brain so i'm thinking about the gut brain connection you know we tend to get really bloated when we're low in estrogen is there is, is that being triggered by something in the brain or are all the brain based symptoms exactly what we would think the mood the even hot flashes could be con controlled by the brain are they the basic ones or am i missing ones that like oh we didn't even think that that would be brain related well you're you're getting it right it's that sense of not having the happiness or satisfaction it is anxiety, depression, paranoia, anhedonia, the loss of uh, of of joy and happiness, yeah. etc. It's all, all of that. those things. Yep, it's okay. it's libido that is also brain based. That's brain okay. based for sure. Basically, yep. it's not your vagina that's causing your menopause; it's your brain. Yep. So, which is how I actually open my book. <laughs> oh well, there you go. That's perfect. Yeah. That's a beautiful yeah. opening. Exactly. It is. It is attributable to my book coach. Thank you, book coach, if you're listening. So, you know, it's the answer is we've got to look at what the brain function is doing, right? Like so often we make it's anxiety and depression are the most common. Okay. Yeah. Forgetfulness, memory, memory lapses, can't concentrate can't see that's the thing if i'd gone to my doctor and said i can't concentrate i'm all over the place adhd meds right yeah so again you, you got to you can't take your maserati to the ford dealership yeah yeah, yeah? exactly <laughs> you gotta think if you if you need nutritional advice don't go to your gp right if you need diabetes medication go to your gp yeah. You break a leg, go to the ER. Don't exactly. go to your nutritionist. Your nutritionist <laughs> can help you a little bit later on getting the things to help build bone, right? So it's all a matter of thinking about that. Now, to go to your question, it's the obvious ones that we are most concerned with. Mm -hmm. uh, hot flashes are absolutely, to the best of our knowledge, a brain-based mechanism around the hypothalamus. Of course, the thyroid is involved in the hypothalamic function, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things we want to really look at. And listen, 
this is a huge number of things. Like a woman is more likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety between the ages of 35 and 45 by a factor of two. So double, double the number of women. And you know, the other thing to consider is that there is an entire estrogenic network in the brain. And the brain estrogen network includes the same parts of the brain that decline in Alzheimer's. Okay, so pause there because yes. I wanted to ask you something very specific with that. So we'll, we'll just jump right into that and then I'll go back to the question I had in my head. Literally today, a friend of mine sent me a post on Instagram. It was Halle Berry being interviewed. I don't even know what she was being interviewed for. But she was saying, and I hope I get this right. She was basically saying that in menopause, all of those hot flashes that we have are like mini strokes. So that's why I wanted to ask you is, are there yeah. any symptoms that are more connected to the brain that we don't, we wouldn't think? I see. Yeah. So yeah. She said they're like mini strokes so that when we look at someone with Alzheimer's and my mom and my grandpa both died of Alzheimer's, I'm APOE4, you bet your ass I'm taking hormones to protect my yep. brain. But exactly. those are like little mini strokes. And then when we look at the brain of Alzheimer's, we see a, a lot of, I, I guess, markers where many, many strokes have occurred contributing to the amyloid plaque and the damage to the brain. Is there truth in what she's saying? I mean, it's Halle Berry. She's not a functional nutritionist or, you know, practitioner, but I guess she's just speaking from what she's diving into since she's in menopause now. Yeah. So there's a reason why she's speaking out, which I'll talk to here in a minute. Okay. And also she is taking something that's very complex and making it very simple, which is, is great because then it's accessible for everyone. And you and I are having, you know, smart ladies having an educated conversation here, but this, this language may be a barrier for some people, in which case she's just bypassing all of that. So let's get back to her in a minute. Okay. APOE4, Me Too, protection. So that is a, a part of the genetics that you know, predisposes us to having Alzheimer's in particular. Yep. And so the the way that the parts of the brain work around Alzheimer's are that, again, there's this estrogenic network that comes down and the mini strokes you asked about. So that is the vascular type, by the way. Mm -hmm. There's different types of Alzheimer's. And there is a very much a vascular component for many, many of the other dementias, as well as Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's sort of the most well-known of the dementia disorders, okay? So I will say that. However, this was a big part of Moscone's research was she was she recognized that there was some kind of menopause switch for Alzheimer's. So she went about finding it. And so it is indeed that decline of estrogen in the parts of the brain that control memory and mood and emotions. Now, you've spent time around someone with Alzheimer's, so have I. Yep. And you know they become a very much a like a baser version of themselves. Those higher functions are gone. Mm -hmm. And they are really about, you know, this is when, it, you know, sort of end stage, right? It's right. Uh, eating, sleeping pooping, that kind of thing. That's the, right. that's their whole existence, right? Right. So obviously the frontal lobe is toast at that point and the prefrontal cortex is part of the brain estrogen network as are the hypothalamus, the brain stem, the limbic system, the amygdala, et cetera. Now let's go to Halle Berry. So Halle Berry is actually, she's she's out there talking about menopause and here's why. She went to her doctor because she found she was very irritated. Her vulva was irritated. She went to her doctor. Her doctor took a quick look and said, you have herpes and gave her herpes medications. When in fact, what she had was the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, which is that the tissues of the vulva get very friable. They get very fragile. And I know I've had a number of women tell me that they can't even wipe with regular paper towel because our uh, toilet paper because it hurts wow. or it cracks and then they have bleeding. So here we have an Oscar winning actress who is well known and a doctor who knows her well, who was so uninformed about a woman's body at midlife that she had this misdiagnosis and she just started talking about it. 
Okay. And she was picked up by some of the senators, I believe. Again, American system, I'm going to get that wrong. I'll butcher it somewhere along the way. And they together went about talking about how we need to have laws that protect information and education for doctors for women around mid- midlife. That's why Halle Berry is talking about it. Okay. Now, in terms of, yes, I, right? I mean, it's good. Let her use her celebrity for it. It's great. Mm-hmm. So in terms of the mini stroke that happen at mid at hot flashes okay so here's what we know we know that women who have the vasomotor symptoms of menopause which are things like hot flashes and night sweats have an increased risk for a cardiovascular event or heart disease so what our physicians should hear when they hear us come in and say we're having hot flashes 27 times a day is I need to do all the things I need to do to take care of this patient of mine for prevention of heart disease, but also to give her some hormones to manage the hot flashes. So we have been able to connect the vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats to heart disease. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. Yeah, Yeah. it really is. Okay. This is me literally just speaking to you from the heart. So Many of you know, I've been where you are with the struggle of weight gain, unexplained. Literally, you're doing everything you can and nothing is working. And I've been in the boat of crushing fatigue, like the type of fatigue you can't explain to anyone unless they've gone through it. The hair loss, legit, when you're counting the hairs that fall out of your head. I get that because I've been there. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. That's why it's my passion to help you specifically get to where you deserve to be, get to optimization land, which I always joke about being in, but it's not really a joke. It's a place. It's a, it's a place of existence in your life where you can enjoy life. You can go out with your friends. You can have a glass of wine. You're not gaining weight, looking sideways at a brownie. You have energy to get through the day. You don't even think about being tired because you're not tired. You're just confident. You're confident in your own body. You're confident in your own skin. And beyond that, you're out of that frustrating cycle of doctor jumping, thinking that maybe this one will listen to me. Maybe this one will actually do what they're supposed to do. And then you're disappointed again and you're crying in your car like I was. So... That is why it's literally been my mission. And I've been working on this for years and finally got here to help every single person in every single state and some of Canada. So we can now prescribe to all 50 states. And the reason why this is important is because if you have low thyroid function and you have low hormones, there is no supplement, there's no diet, there's no lifestyle change that you can do to build those hormones back up. And I flat out call BS on any program out there that promises you optimization without actually using bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, including thyroid hormone replacement. If you're not making hormones properly, you're not making hormones properly and we have to replace that. Now, many of you are in the process of begging your doctor for bioidentical hormones that they're uneducated on. They tell you scary things that just, you know, don't believe them. And many of you are trying to beg your doctor to give you the right thyroid medication. Well, you can stop that now too because we can order all the labs, prescribe all the bioidentical hormones, all the thyroid medication, all the things. We can do that to all 50 states and most of Canada. Now, when you work with me, when you work with my team, you are getting personalized, personalized plans, personalized treatment plans, personalized nutrition, the whole deal, top to bottom. You get what you need to get to the finish line, to enjoy your life, to live with me in optimization land, which is where you deserve to be. You deserve that. So click the link in the show notes, book a free call. We're going to go over everything with you. You don't have to remember everything I just said. The one thing you have to remember is I've been there. I can help you. I promise you're not that tough of a case. And it doesn't matter where you live in the United States and parts of Canada. 
we can help you. Okay, so here's what we know. We know that women who take HRT have a decreased risk of heart disease by 50%. So I have many members of my family who have uttered, had their demise because of a cardiac event. So I'm really paying attention to that one. Yeah, We know that women who take HRT have a 38% decreased risk of Alzheimer's. That's huge. That's it's huge. I mean, that's huge. huge. Yeah. I don't know the numbers around osteoporosis, but it is also significant. So ultimately, when you're taking HRT, you're not just protecting your brain and your heart, but you're protecting your bones as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So many benefits. We're going to get into the benefits as well, but I want to stick with these, these brain symptoms. Mm -hmm. and thank you for clarifying what Halle Berry was saying, because I was like, Oh, is this true? That's interesting. Why is she talking? Yeah. Why is she talking yeah. about this? So that's interesting. And I am happy she's speaking out for sure. Now, I've heard Lisa Moscone interviewed and our friend, Dr. Mindy Pels talks about this as well. Mm -hmm. And when I heard both of them talk about this particular aspect of menopause, it really clicked for me. And I went, oh, that's exactly what's happening. For lack of a better description, it's that all fucks are no longer given. Like literally <laughs> your, your arm your fucks are down. <laughs> yes. I spent all my fuck bucks. The, ar the armor is down and yeah. literally the things that would normally bother you don't anymore. And that is a beautiful thing. So yes. is it's also something in your research that is tied to menopause. And this could actually be a, a positive that we can, we can ride the wave on. Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. So we know that with the estrogenic decline, what happens is we have less connectivity in the brain. We have changing brain fuel systems. We have less gray matter volume. We have less cerebral blood flow. We have less neuroplasticity. And that's the ability for the neural networks to come together and create new pathways. So what does that mean? It means, this is Moscone's research, is she's shown that the fuel system changes. There's a renovation that happens in the brain at midlife. And during that time, there's a period of time where things go a little bit dim. Now, let me explain that because I don't want anybody feeling like this is going to be the rest of your life. I say dim. We sense dim, as in, there's at least twice now that you've been talking, like, what the hell was I talking about again? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right? right. So just I do have blip. a pen. Just a little, you know, yeah. Yeah. A little I have a little pen and paper to start talking about the brain and estrogen. Fiona will be fine. It'll come out. <laughs> but this is what the research is showing. Okay. So first of all, huge renovation that happens where all of those things I just mentioned, less processing power, less blood flow, less, all of those things are happening. Mm -hmm. But what the research also shows us is that within four years of our last menstrual period, we have exactly the same function as we did before. Okay. So we go, it's not that we go back, we have renovated forward. Okay. The renovation is a terminology that Dr. Moscone uses. And I think it's a really good one. It's useful. Mm -hmm. Now I know for me as a woman who's in that, not yet at the four year mark, what I worry about is, I mean, my brain is my entire life, right? If that disappears, I'm hooped. So you know, this was this was the reason I created the Brain Health Master Course for Women, which is a course I run once a year and talk about in the book as well, was because I took my own tools when I started to feel my own decline happening back in 2020 and put them together in a way that was really easy for me to understand. And then I thought, I bet there's a lot of other women that want it. Turns out there are. So what we know is that that function returns and the testing that is done on us, the cognitive testing that's done on us in this time period where we feel like we're a little bit dim, we're not as quick, we've got the memory lapses, we lose words, concentration, you know, all those things, the testing shows that we actually test exactly the same way as we did before all that started. So it's only a feeling on the inside. Okay. Isn't that That's fascinating? Bad. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So do not throw in the towel, ladies. It is all good. Carry on because women are damn good at just that. So, oh, we totally are. We absolutely are. So wait, now what I'm hearing is yep. if we can start hormones before these detrimental symptoms start coming on, 
can that prevent it? Now, like I shared, I've been on hormones since perimenopause and I plan to continue, but I still notice that armor, that brain armor coming down. And I just, you know, more, I guess more emotional stability, maybe a little bit more flat affect, less emotional, Yep, in a good and bad way that can go either way. But definitely there's a freedom in, in not giving a fuck anymore. And, Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't want that to go away, but I do yeah. want my brain to function and I don't want hot flashes and I want to protect against Alzheimer's. So is, is really, is it, is it hormones that are the answer or is it hormones and? It's hormones and. Okay. So we have lifestyle things that we can do that are very, very helpful for this. And some things just don't require a whole lot of hormones, right? Some things we just need a little bit to make sure we're staying in that safe zone that we're preventing, we're protecting our heart, our brain, our bones, and it's giving us what we need. For me, I'm not sure where my sleep would be without the progesterone. But then you talk about the no fucks to give, right? Here's what's fascinating about that. You're absolutely right. It's two sides of the same coin. I started this conversation talking to you about my own experience with anhedonia. It's the same process. So I actually said this to my therapist the other day. I said, you know, it's funny. I don't dance with fear anymore. And I know fear really, really, really well. Yeah. Right. But it's just not there, which is I'll take it. I have so much more space in my brain because it's not there. Right. Mm -hmm. So is that the, you know, is the, is the also losing the edge of what that glorious emotion of seeing a field full of sunflowers or a puppy or whatever, you know, Oh, I had a puppy come visit me in the office yesterday. So I'm still excited about those guys, but you know what I'm saying, right? It's, it's a little bit, we have to give a little bit to get the benefit of it as well. Now is taking hormones the answer. Yes, start your hormones if you can before you stop your periods. Whether your GP will get on board with that, your prescribing physician is another story. But the truth is you have experts like Dr. Amy and myself that you can reach out to. If we can't help you, we know people that can help you. So don't hesitate. Don't stay in a place, right? And okay. and yes, I recognize there is a privilege with that. But I think those of us that are big hearted are working on accessibility for all. And so I'll leave that down. But I I think the question is, all the lifestyle things really matter. The quality of sleep, the quality of the relationships you have. Do you have toxicity in your life, whether it is mold in your basement or a shitty stepmom? All of those things need to go, right? You need to protect yourself first. And, and certainly nutrition is a huge part of that. Getting the supplements are a huge part of that that can help with longevity. There's just so many things. Getting great sleep, I think I started with that. Addressing inflammation. Like there's so many things that we can do to help the process. So I had a patient, again, scenario I'll, I'll give you. I had a patient come see me yesterday and she said, I'm here for a second opinion. Okay, she was new to me. She said, I have pellets and I'm not sure how I feel about having these things stuck in me. Mm -hmm. And I said, and she said, what do you think? Can I just, can I just like take them out and manage this myself with a good diet? And I said, well, first of all, I'm a really good person to ask that of because for, so I started the Not Your Mother's Menopause podcast in 2016. And at that time, we hadn't yet had the research that said hormones were safe. And most of us were in perimenopause, but things weren't loud enough yet to really for for the 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 rallying cry of the Gen Xers, right? That hadn't right. happened yet like it is now. And I said, I'm a really good person to ask because for most of the time that I have done this work, I've given the lifestyle. That has been my main, the supplements at the right time, in the right dose for the right thing. That's my toolkit, Until I started to see the research come out about 21, maybe 22 is when that started to come out. And I really had to pay attention. I was like, now, just a minute now. At the time, my mother was in the throes of dementia Mm -hmm. and my father had passed away and I was watching this stuff. This was my family history. I was watching this saying, I don't want to go down like that. Yeah. Right. So for me, I started to really pay attention and it was pretty clear, pretty fast. If you even look at half a dozen of these research papers, there is such benefit for us if the hormones are done in the right dosage for optimization and they're monitored and they are done in a safe fashion. So this is what I said to the patient yesterday. I said, 
how are you with taking pills and patches and creams and potions? She said, I'm terrible at it. I said, okay, tell me about how your doctor's managing your pellets. She said, she looks at my blood work two to three times a year and adjusts the pellets accordingly. So I said to her, I said, okay, well, I'm not thrilled about the pellets. We don't know a lot. They're not well regulated. They're expensive, all of those things. Yeah. But if you're not going to be the guy that's going to be testosterone on this side and progesterone on this side, and then you put one of the progesterone you squirt it on and the others you take internally, and then you take the saw palmetto to make sure the testosterone goes down the right, <laughs> right. pathway. Like, and I, I literally laid it all out. She's like, I am not that guy. I said, stick with the pellets. Cause at least you've got somebody and something. Right. When so many do not even have a doctor that will even listen to them about this. So am I endorsing pellets? Not at all. For this patient, it made sense. And I think this speaks to something that I think is really important in modern menopause care is that we need individuation and Western medicine isn't great at individuation. Yes. So this, much. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. At this point, for example, for myself, I don't need estrogen. Some point I will, but yeah. progesterone and testosterone, oh, hell yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Everybody is different. Everyone is different. Everyone's unique. Well, it's the same thing that I see with, with thyroid is that it's a one size fits all, even in, even in functional medicine. A lot of functional medicine practitioners who just don't know the thyroid will give everybody NDT. And that's it. And they think that they're doing a miraculous job because they're using natural desiccated thyroid. It's like, well, no, yeah. it has to be individualized. So same thing with hormones. Absolutely has to be individualized. And I, I completely agree with you. I would rather have a woman on erratic, sometimes too much hormone in the form of pellets than no hormones at all. You know, yeah. okay, yeah, with the pellets, you might get a little bit of hair loss because there goes the testosterone up to dude mm -hmm. levels, but but it's better than nothing at all. So I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, and again, this really speaks to that. You've got to have somebody who knows what you're doing. Each woman's scenario is different. I asked her what was in her family history. She said tons of Alzheimer's. I mm -hmm. said, well, then you better, if you cannot stick to putting the creams on and taking the pills at the right time, if you're not that guy, keep the pellets in. Yep. Put that pellet in your butt and let it ride. So <laughs> at least you're getting something. <laughs> Now you exactly. had mentioned supplements. Are there any like non-negotiables? This is what you must start taking when you enter perimenopause. The answer is yes, but they're not, they're general support. They're not necessarily hormonal support, if that helps. Yeah. And I would say the Dr. Lovely trifecta is what we call it in the office, have for many years, mm -hmm. is fish oil, probiotics, and vitamin D. Okay. Everybody, every human. Okay. Right? Needs to be taking that. And chances are you're probably taking not enough vitamin D. Right. So, you know, cause we just don't, we see those numbers and we think they go, Oh, 5,000, 10,000. Oh my God. Okay. Listen in Canada here, even if we're outside every day in the three months of summer, we get, we do not get enough sunshine. We're too far North of the equator. It just doesn't happen. And one of my favorite teachers in functional medicine has a practice in San Diego, in San Diego, sunniest place in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. He tests vitamin D on all his patients, every single one. And he said, by far, the majority of them do not have enough. So if San Diego doesn't have it, Calgary, Alberta, for sure does not have it. Right. So vitamin D for sure. The other things I would add, probiotics for gut and brain health. And mm -hmm. what's really interesting is we're starting to see probiotics, which are the gut bugs that communicate constantly between the body and the brain via the vagus nerve. What we're really starting to see now is a pretty cool creation of formulations based on symptomatology, because we know there are certain bugs that are connected to certain brain-based phenomenon like anxiety, depression, but body things too, which is really quite interesting. So I'm curious to investigate that further. B12, liquid B12 is a big one for anybody over the age of 40, men or women, but especially women because we bleed and lots of times in our 40s, we bleed a lot and anemia is a real problem. So assessing every patient for anemia that is a female in my practice is a pretty important part of something I do fairly regularly because we know 
and I've done entire podcast episodes on this, we know that when the brain doesn't have enough oxygen, it doesn't matter what fancy things I do to fix brain, brain's not getting fixed. So you must amend anemia. It literally is the reason probably that you're having the anxiety and depression and low libido, etc. So it's just different for everybody. Maybe it's low hormones. Maybe it's the fact that you've been anemic for 12 years and your doctor said after you gave birth to your last child, oh, it's fine. You'll figure it out eventually. Don't worry about it. Right. right. You know, and it, and it really is because a Western medicine doesn't have a quick fix to that. You can't give a transfusion to every woman that has anemia because there's many of us and many of us. Low B12 is a big part in whether or not we actually have the cells we need uh, to take the oxygen to the brain, which is what we're looking at in terms of and all the tissues actually in the body. What else? Whatever. Oh, magnesium, magnesium glycinate at bedtime. For mm -hmm. sure, if a woman is constipated, then magnesium citrate, you know, and, and then I would add in other things depending on the history. So yeah. if there's a thyroid history or suspected thyroid, I'd be adding in some, make sure you have a Brazil nut every day, make sure right. you're taking some kelp tablets, make sure, etc. Adrenal support is very common in my office. I do lots of that. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the big ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. I may have missed some, but um I, those are the ones I like for pretty much everybody, but we can get far more specific depending on what's going on with someone's symptomatology. Yeah, back to the personalization. So just like we would personalize hormones, you can personalize the supplement regimen, but that's a really nice base. And I, I think it's important for women to know, you know, you can have that base of supplementation, then you can go over here, just like you were saying earlier, go see the nutritionist, work on your nutrition, address any deficiencies or insulin resistance. If you need to cut your carbs, increase your protein, whatever. Yes, you need to get the sleep component. That's 100%. But in your opinion, even doing all of that, is that enough without the bioidentical hormone replacement? For very few women, that would be enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when we were in our 30s, we could do that. And that was enough. But as we've just come through this massively stressful time as a global community, as our generation are passing through the the end bits of perimenopause, if you will, mm -hmm. depending on where they are how, in terms of age, there's just there's there's too much. There's too much going on. There's too much stress. We we glorify it. We glorify busyness, all of those things that saps our resources. Yeah. So I don't know, stack the deck in, in your, in your favor by taking the hormones. I just, he, here's the thing. I know there's a lot of discussion about, do we test? Do we not test? Now you practice functional medicine. Like I do for me, we must always look, yep. we are not going to give a woman testosterone unless she has low testosterone. Right. Right now, sometimes like thyroid's a great example. A woman will have all of the symptoms on the checklist. And her thyroid still shows in the normal zone. Mm -hmm. But you and I know enough to know, hold on a minute, we need to support some things. Yeah. So again, it's that individuation. But um, you can definitely stack the deck in your favor. Yeah. By doing yeah. the lifestyle. The lifestyle and the hormones together. Mm -hmm. I think it just goes together. It, it, it has to be the both and. Now, you had mentioned earlier, and I agree with you, that we really do need to make these hormones more accessible to women. And and I believe I couldn't tell you which country it was. I thought it was the UK, but I might be wrong, where it they is. actually they give yep. hormones. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. Yep. It's like standard of care. Yes. So, because kudos to the UK yep. for knowing that hormones provide massive amounts of protection, just like you said earlier, bone, brain, breast, heart, in addition to quality of life. Now we are not that lucky here. I honestly, in my heart of hearts, do not see a time in our lifetime where our governments will give out hormones to men and women for mm -hmm. prevention. So mm -hmm. if someone is just stuck, what's your opinion on the over-the-counter creams? I know some people are using wild yam. I always tell women, you're not a yam. So at least do like the OTC progesterone bias yeah. that you can get. What, what's your opinion on the over-the-counter hormones? I know we can't do testosterone. You know, there's some supplements and like Toncat Ali, Tribulus that can increase testosterone. Mm -hmm. but, but what about the creams? Yeah, they are not available in Canada. So okay. only in the US are those available. And oof, it depends on the person. 
right? If I, you know, we, we have this philosophy, I like to say to my patients, with this philosophy that more is better, and which I say, we're not talking about boobies or beer. More may not necessarily be better. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But if we put on the cream and we have a really good night's sleep that we got, you know, in the, you know, vitamin cottage or whatever, and we have a really good night's sleep, we go, oh, I'll put on a little bit more next time and then a little bit more. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just think there needs to be caution. But the truth is not everybody. I mean, this is the two of us educated, privileged women having this conversation. We have access to this. Right. So if a woman does not have access to it, could she try it? Yes, but be cautious for yourself. Give it a go. But for God's sakes, don't slather half a bucket on your wrist and go, that's it, I'm fixed. <laughs> <laughs> right. And when you are able, please have somebody take a look at your, your do a hormone panel. I call it the well women panel at midlife. And, you know, it's all of the, the important and pertinent hormones, thyroid, inflammatory markers, et cetera, that I think are really important. And then that, that'll give you some information as to whether or not you're even absorbing it and if it's too much or not enough. Mm -hmm. Nope. I agree with that. And so on that note for testing, do you prefer blood? Do you like Dutch tests, saliva? What method do you use? Uh, okay, I think there's a place for all of them. So I'm in Canada, socialized medicine we have here. I can't order the labs myself as a chiropractor, but I can read them. If I, I send off a letter to a, a patient's GP and say, can we take a look at these things? And pretty rarely do they say no, because they're just grateful to have somebody else sort of backing up and looking at these things. But sometimes it does happen. I think most of them are just grateful for the help, to be honest. And then I'll I'll take a look at the the labs and say, okay, now you need to go back to your GP and say, it's time for an estrogen patch. It's time for maybe some estrogen cream for the vulva if you're having repeat UTIs or progesterone, uh, bioidentical progesterone, mm -hmm. you know, for sleep or whatever. Yep. That's when things get a little sticky. So typically we try going through the socialized system first. If it doesn't work, then I recommend a woman to private care. Mm -hmm. which we can do here as well. Uh, saliva I did for most of my career. I still do it, although I do it more rarely now because we try to run it through. I mean, we pay all these taxes up in here, here in Canada, for God's sakes, they could pay for our blood work, right? Right. <laughs> so I do less of it. But sometimes a woman is just like, I am so done with trying to be talking to my doctor about it. Let's just do a saliva panel. And this brings up the Dutch. Sometimes a woman gets the estrogen patch and she doesn't feel any better. Why is that happening? That's when we can start to look at the metabolites and get an idea if we can support her better. And that's when I think the the dried urine testing can be helpful. Okay. How about you? What do you think? I, I'm kind of the same way. I like blood. It's easy. It gives us that baseline. Then as we both do, we always ask the patient, how do you feel? And pair yep. that up, pair up the symptoms with what we're seeing in the labs and then the Dutch test. So it's funny. I, I heard this at A4M and it kind of stuck with me. So now I use it. You know, a lot of women will run out and they'll get the Dutch test and they might be, you know, 35, 40 years old, not on any hormones. And I'm like, that's great, but you just dropped $500 and you're not even on hormones. And the, yeah. the quote that I heard was looking at a Dutch test for women who are not taking any hormone replacement is like doing an audit of a 16 year old's bank account. <laughs> You're just not going to see much. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, and of course we have our own hormones and yes, it's nice to lo look and see, are we even, you know, metabolizing our hormones down the right pathway and all of that. But it's just, I think an unnecessary cost unless yeah. you are taking hormones. And now we really want to see how are you using those hormones? Exactly. Exactly. And we have to remember, you know, I've seen medicine get really critical of those of us that don't have a Western medicine license. Oh, sure. And medicine has to remember that they were not listening. They were not picking up the phone for an entire generation of women. And so folks like you and I, who didn't want anything to do with that system in terms of our professional lives have come up with alternatives. And the Dutch is one of those alternatives. Mm -hmm. 
I know I've seen some of the the big name menopause gals just lamb like just giving it lambasting it and I'm like okay hold on a second before you judge you need to look at your own history and remember there was a time where you also spoke to women in menopause like you're talking to us now so we were just here to help long before you were mm -hmm. so I've been yep. shout as I say in my book I've been shouting in the menopause void for 20 years now finally there are people listening oh my gosh well that's a mic drop moment right there keep preaching girl <laughs> keep preaching keep spreading the word because <laughs> no you. this is, that's exactly it if women did not have voices like yours we would all be just suffering and moving through life watching different disease states come about losing mm -hmm. our bone mass watching our memory decline and and i mean you're like me, like I'm, I'm 50. I'm not ready to throw in the towel yet. Hell no. There's so much more to do. And I need my brain and body functioning at a high level. And if that means taking hormones, hell yeah. Hell yes. I'm yeah. going to take hormones one way or another. I will find them and I will take them. If I can put them <laughs> in my butt, I'll put them in my butt. But, but hormones are going to be in my body and we yeah. need messengers like yourself educating women this has been fantastic I, I love it because women are going to so connect with the brain connection now they're going to be like oh my gosh that's me and then just shouting from the rooftops listen ladies there's a better life there's more answers there are more answers than what you're getting from your gp and western medicine yes and i'd like to say if you're experiencing any of the the mood issues of perimenopause like so many of us there's a very good chance the remedy for that, other than to get rid of the toxic relationships, et cetera, right. is hormones mm -hmm. before antidepressant or any of the psychotropic drugs, anti-anxiety, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yes. I want to be really plainly say that because it is getting missed. There is research that shows that very thing is the most helpful. And the third thing on that list is the lifestyle changes. So the recommendation from a, a case review uh, review of the research that was existing was give hormones first. If that doesn't resolve the, the psychology, the brain-based symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, then you consider a psychotropic medication and finally the lifestyle. But of course, that bit of information isn't getting out there, but it is out there. Yeah. Progesterone is the new Prozac. So. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> just is, just is. Well, Dr. Fiona, what do you, what do you do with people? How can people find you work with you, listen to your podcast, all that good stuff? Yes. I love that. Thank you. So all roads lead back to drlovely.com. So people can go there to find uh, sort of my Instagram and, and all of that. But the podcast I just released, I think episode 132 came out this week. So I do solos sometimes and I interview just as uh, I have interviewed you for my show. Thank you very much. And it's called Not Your Mother's Menopause Podcast and you can find it um, on all platforms. And I just, uh, I just want to say this work is so, it's such a calling for me. And I know you understand that because there's lots of times I'm going through this right now as I'm working on my, on my book proposal is I just get so angry. I get so stuck in the injustice of it. It pisses me off. Yes. Yes. Did I mention it was Gen X? <laughs> I know. I get it. No, we're both pissed off and we're, yes. and we're, we're not quiet about it. If you don't no. like it, don't listen, you know, don't listen, go yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. Exactly. You're going to get a sassy and sweary approach from me because that is my irreverent style. And um, that's what I respond to. That's what the women around me respond to. But also I think it comes out in the show. You know, I just, I get pretty excited about these things and it, you said it yourself. It's that shouting from the rooftops. Like that, that anger is fuel for me. It's like, yes. no more. Are we going to put up with this small version of what women's health is and should be? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I love it. We speak the same language. That's why I we love, do. <laughs> love you. So we'll put Let all your back the show notes. We're probably going to do more. I mean, we'll, yes, we'll probably do a part two on both of ours. So yes, <laughs> we'll definitely be seeing each other again. I love it. It's All right, true. girl. Well, true. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been amazing. And I know my audience appreciates you as well. 
You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I look forward to next time.